Thank you. Um, I've stood in this evening um, and I'm giving a version of a lecture I first gave to the New Insights in 16th, 17th century architecture conference about 18 months ago. So turning to the first slide. Oh dear. Ah, here we are. Right. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, this picturesque fragment variously thatched and covered with ancient ivy, um, was all that remained of the house of the Archbishops of Canterbury at Otford in Kent. It had been in a similar state when the Kent historian Edward Hastard described it in the middle of the 18th century. I'll attempt in this lecture to explain how it related to the palace into which Archbishop Warham transformed the medieval house in the early 16th century, and why this section alone um, survives today as a recognizable structure. Oxford was one of several houses on the favored southern route taken by the archbishops um, when traveling between Canterbury and Lambeth Palace. And these journeys, of course, were pretty frequent um, between their two major residences. The route followed the foot of the North Downs, which are roughly here, um, with stops at Charing in the East, Maidstone, Otford, and Croydon. From 1456, the nearby house at Knoll was also used in conjunction with Otford, um, gifted to the archdiocese by its initial builder, um, Archbishop Boucher. In recent years, I also had the opportunity to investigate Charing here and Croydon, um, like Otford, primarily to inform the management of change. Rotham um, here was um, it abandoned early, but perhaps I'll have the opportunity to review Maidstone at some time um, to get a complete picture of these major staging posts. The palaces, um, even on this principal route, were very different. Each was the result of incremental decisions by successive archbishops, influenced not only by the practicalities of providing staging posts on a, region, uh, on a frequently uh, traveled route, but also their appeal, or otherwise, as country houses, suited to entertaining visitors up to and including the monarch. By way of context, then, um, I'm going to look briefly at Charing um, to the east and Croydon to the west. Charing, as I noted, was the first stage from Canterbury, and it declined to a farmstead around 1700. Of its largely 14th century buildings, the Great Hall um, became a barn. Um, the lodging ranges here became farm buildings and the archbishop's private apartments um, became the farmhouse, losing the outer ranges in the process. The, the private apartments, of course, being linked to the high dais end of the hall by a pentis. And there at the bottom is the uh, great hall and its porch. Um, there is the archbishop's residence. Um, there is the Lepentis link. And that Charing seems very much to have been a staging post which could, could accommodate a large retinue in the extensive lodging ranges um, and in the large hall. The private apartments were not palatial in scale or quality, but frequently adapted and extended on a modest scale. Croydon, the other end, the last stage before Lambeth, 
and unlike Oxford and Charing, was not expropriated by Henry VIII, remaining the property of the archbishops until 1780. It most definitely was palatial, and its surviving core shows a very complex evolution. In reality, probably even more so than this phased plan um, suggests. The service buildings, lodgings, and stables around an outer court were destroyed in the 19th century, and this plan from 1780 shows the surviving elements in red and the lost elements um, hatched. This complex incremental development is also clear from the sequence of block plans on the left. Um, and the scale and ambition of the principal interiors illustrated by the Great Hall, for example, at the bottom, and the Great Chamber or Audience Chamber um, at the top. Its expansion culminated, save for the Long Gallery, which I'll mention again later, um, by about 1500, following extensive works by Archbishop Morton, and these are in red here, um, not long before Warham began his great rebuilding, remodeling of Otford, to which I'll now turn. The context of the recent study, as some listening I know um, will, will know very well, was the need to produce a conservation statement when Seven Oaks Council, Jones parts of the site, um, were considering its future. As a long tradition in Oxford of local study, and the results of that were picked up by Rosalys Coop in her pioneering 1986 survey of origins of the Long Gallery in England. This project, um, like others, included study of the surviving structures. And here also drawing um, together the results of uh, relatively recent field work particularly geophysical survey by the West Kent Archaeological Society, to whom I'm most grateful. He also draws on work by our fellow Alden Gregory um, for sharing his work on Knoll, whose story was closely connected with Oxford through the 15th and 16th centuries. Oxford stands where the Pilgrims Way at the foot of the North Downs um, here and carrying on across the um, valley of the River Darrant um, meets the North-South route alongside the River Darrant here. Now, the geography, of course, and the many springs in the area made it a favoured location for settlement um, for uh, or over millennia, um, with a Roman villa here, um, uh, uh, two, and another major Roman building over here, um, uh, uh, certainly large, um, perhaps um, use and function unknown. The core of the medieval house here was mooted, um, and initially it was quite small, with um, uh, no outer court. Um, there, is, there is the original moat underlying part of the um, 16th century palace. So over here. But the, the, the moat island began to be enlarged by the middle of the 14th century. The main attraction of Oxford before Archbishop Warham's vast extensions was probably its two great hunting parks. William Warham was over 50 when he was appointed to the See of Canterbury in 1503, and he served um, um, until his death in 1529. He was well-educated, well-traveled in Europe in royal service, but had no previous um, record as a patron of building. He started works in 1504 at Knoll 
a house bought personally by Archbishop Boucher in 1456, but which he gave to the see in 1480. It served for him and for Warham as a secluded retreat from public office. In parallel, Warham began remodeling Otford, which he found ruinous by neglect on a princely scale as a house for show and entertaining no guests. The rather sporadic references suggest that by the time of Henry VIII's succession in 1508, Warham had begun the remodeling and extension of the medieval moated house um, at Oxford. Work was still in hand in 1514 when Henry stayed at Oxford, and it was probably more or less complete by the time Cardinal Campeggio stayed in 1518. Certainly by 1523, um, according to Erasmus, who stayed there, the words are on the uh, slide, um, it seems uh, very much to have been completed. Warham spent, by his own account, over £30,000 on the archiepiscopal houses, most of it here at um, Oxford, um, an immense sum um, in the values of the day. You can see how very different um, the two parts of the house appear on the plan. The medieval house here, um, it remodeled and very irregular, and Warham's outer court here, of which this northwest part survives. As well as the uh, surviving structure, recorded walls, and a very important 1974 excavation by Brian Philp of this southeast corner, the plans really do show the contribution of the 2016 Geophysical Survey, um, utilizing, for those who are not familiar with, with Geophys, utilizing here the variable electrical resistivity of the ground. Um, red on the, the plot indicates um, high resistance like walls and rubble, decreasing across the spectrum to purple soft conductive material like the filling of the moat over here and this very low low lying ground here. But our knowledge is still very partial and can be misleading. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence and as that is especially true where walls have been robbed or there has been major disturbance, like the modern vicarage here top right, um, which ha has entirely obliterated any signs of the uh, north range of the outer court here, um, when one knows full well they were there. Um, so one has to interpret this, it doesn't provide an instant plan. Um, it works best in the outer court where the walls along here particularly actually grin through the grass or are exposed in the side of this stream. Now the inner court, um, most of the area within the moat was developed as housing in the 1930s and 40s and one can see these little house or large houses um, strung across its site. Part of the south curtain stands still um, as the garden wall punctuated by drives um, along the um, modern road. Although surviving surveys of 1537, these are written surveys, not drawn surveys, 1537, 1548, and 1573, all post-date Warham's time, um, combined with the physical evidence, they allow us to understand the general disposition of the elements. Um, the 1537 survey, quoted on the screen, identifies the gallery in front of the hall forming the north facade of the house here. The hall was the dominant building in this, this area. 
um, services lying to the east, the kitchen and um, privy kitchen and larders. Um, and the high end, the great chamber and the principal royal lodgings um, over to the, to the west. The jumble of alignments, of course, reflects the, this, the incremental growth of the site. And although um, one can plot walls, some of which have been found and recorded during rebuilding, not all of these walls um, located thus are necessarily contemporary. So there are limits um, to how far one can interpret um, this area without excavation. To, to the south of the hall, though, there was a small courtyard here, flanked by two-story lodging ranges here and here, um, with rooms off corridors here and here, um, articulated by a three-story tower rising from the um, extended moat. Remember, the earlier moat is in, in here. This looks as though it was possibly intended as a start of a complete rebuild. Um, but the rest of Warham's work on the main house with all these strange alignments um, is clearly an adaptation and extension um, related around two principal buildings, the Great Hall and the chapel, which we know from documents was retained from the earlier building. Hence the quote, the hall was environed about with galleries and towers and turret of stone and the chapel embattled and part covered with lead. It gives one some idea of the appearance of the, the place. So looking, looking at the outer court, this is curiously trapezoidal in plan, um, but it's almost symmetrical in its layout around the great gatehouse. Um, the plan, of course, is substantially clear both from the ge geophysical survey and the surviving elements of the western half and indeed this wall of the eastern half. Essentially, it comprised two-story galleries um, connecting the main house to octagonal corner towers and other galleries wider flanking the central gatehouse here. These complemented the, the gallery, which I mentioned earlier, with projecting bay windows um, across the north front of the main house. But continuous perambulation um, in the manner of a monastic cloister was not intended. On the west was the privy gallery, 304 feet long leading from the privy lodgings over here, um, with the privy garden on the west. Very damp area, and nothing of the documented garden layout um, has, has been detected, in certainly not in geophysical uh, surveys. The East Gallery was 228 feet long and overlooked the cook or kitchen garden. Um, and the reflection of this side survived in agricultural buildings um, into the 19th century, this is 1844. Uh, much more detailed information about the, the outer court comes from the standing building. All the ranges um, were built with ragstone, plinths, brick walls to the lower floor, timber framed above and wholly timber framed to the gallery facing the privy garden to the west. One can see here that is the line of the uh, timber framing where it engaged with the brick um, tower in the corner and the plaster has actually survived to mark that, that line. Um, the First floor here dates from the early 20th century after the picturesque thatch caught fire and the range was heightened 
to roughly its original height um, and um, the, became a range of three cottages. The lower gallery had an open cloister with a flat ceiling because they are plank joists to create a flat soffit. Um, the upper gallery on top of that was almost certainly enclosed. Um, the roofs are documented as being leaded, but they were not accessible for exercise as some gallery roofs were because there is no door from the stair turret out onto to this level. There was a lobby at the upper end of the gallery, um, first floor here, um, mostly to deal with the le level changes. It's there. The northern upper gallery here um, was accessible separately from the stair. Um, there are two doors at the, the head of the stair. So the galleries were not connected at this level. Um, nor were they connected at either level to the gatehouse. Um, all of this is on an incredibly small scale in term in vertical scale and scale of building. The Privy Gallery was only about uh, 2.9 meters wide inside, um, less than 10 feet. The same as the corridor serving the lodging ranges at the southeast corner of the main house that we've seen. A block of lodgings was interposed between the gallery and the garden by 1537, that's along here. Um, so it's certainly a Warham's time, but these are especially equally small scale and having, we know from surveys, a tiled, i.e. pitch roof, um, uh, may be an afterthought, but I can't find a, a, a close parallel for, for, well, for, for such a thing um, anywhere else. And the extant upper floor built after the fire of 1714 does give a reasonable idea of the original proportions. Um, imagine a flat roof, however, at roughly its eaves level, not a pitched one, um, and a crenellated parapet and chimneys um, to the corner tower and the gatehouse here of equivalent or possibly even greater height. This is one, there is the gate, gate passage. We've got the lower part, the lower story of one half of the gatehouse surviving. And again, one must imagine this being replicated um, on the other side of the center line here. So very large courtyard in extent but the buildings containing it are really um, uh, very modest, um, apart from the, the towers of the corners and the gatehouse. The 1775 um, view down here from Haston shows remnants of the crenellated parapet still then surviving. Now the three-story um, corner towers have um, one high status heated lodging chamber to each floor um, with a stack of guard robes, one accessible from each level um, in the corner. Um, and they were, they were ventilated through chimney-like um, vents rising above, above roof level. In contrast to the galleries, the flat leaded roof here was accessible. The stair continued up beyond the top floor to end in a little turret because inside the surviving turret, clearly the treads go on right up to roof level. The upper two rooms were panelled. Here are the uh, bonding or fixing timbers built into the brickwork um, in order to fix the panelling. The lower story, however, um, was plastered. Again, all these um, chambers had flat um, ceilings on plank joists. Um, 
the significance of that is if one was going to create a decorated ceiling, um, one needs a flat soffit um, in order to do so. It doesn't mean to say they were actually decorated, um, but uh, uh, the, 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 it provided the potential. Um, quite different from medieval floor joists, which are laid flat and between downstanding bridging beams here, the bridging beams are contained, were contained in the depth of the floor. Mm. Turning to the great gatehouse, um, the surviving half had on the ground floor originally one large chamber and the porter's lodge to the front served by adjacent doors, one of which survives intact. The other um, has an enlarged rear arch surviving, but no doubt that it's original. Um, the first floor plan here is a sketch by John Thorpe in his manuscript book of architecture, which is in Sir John Soane's museum. Um, and he made it probably from the, the archeology span of the book as it were, um, about 1605 to six. And it's a tiny sketch um, on the back of another drawing. It's only about an inch square. Um, it shows the layout of the um, chamber. There, there in pencil is the opposite side of the gatehouse. The gate passage is under here. Um, and the, that is that as it were. But it shows also potential alterations of which more anon, um, a stair arising, uh, arising up this side. Um, the external stair serves a, a two room, served a two room lodging on the first floor, um, flanking a central room over the gate passage but the division internally here was in reality timber rather than brick. Thorpe has drawn it um, incorrectly from, from memory, which is not uncommon in his notebook drawings. Like all of the outer court and probably the main house, the gatehouse is entirely late Gothic in its details, windows and doors. And parallels for the form of the gatehouse. Um, it's documented as having three roofs, so that um, there is a suggestion, therefore, that we have three story lodgings flanking a tall central room over the passage. Um, it's a smaller scale and simpler version of the concept, really exemplified by Archbishop's. Archbishop Morton's gatehouse at Lambeth on the left from circa um, 1490 and Wolsey's great gatehouse at Hampton Court, virtually contemporary, 1522, um, as it was built rather than as it now exists. Um, Otford, I think, had um, only three stories in the sides, um, not as uh, grand in scale or detail as these, but um, I think, hope you get the idea. And the, on the approach, um, the towers and the gatehouse were deeply projecting forwards um, on the entrance front um, to give perhaps um, a greater Im impression of grandeur and scale, bearing in mind that the um, linking corridor gallery blocks had eaves about this at this level, um, or a parapet at this level, but certainly very different in scale from the um, projecting towers. Um, so a very strongly articulated front, and the galleries must have appeared much more like a curtain wall of a, of, of a castle or a, a town wall. Um, than building ranges from this side, because this, there do not seem to have been any original windows in the um, brick outer wall of the, the galleries, linking tower and gatehouse. Um, 
it's now very difficult to appreciate on the ground because the main axis is blocked by other building that's off to the to the left to the front we've just been looking at, at this elevation here um, with the tower very strongly projecting um, gatehouse towers and corner towers. They probably fronted a great green in, in this area. Um, as far as the road junction over here, its remnant survives in the current um, green in a slightly darker tone. This was the site of the medieval fair, and there was a court hall here um, with um, a, a, a meeting room over a covered ground floor. The date is 1330 to 50, so long predating the, um, the outer court. Um, and um, west of the parish church, which Warham also largely rebuilt. So the entrance, um, the, the vista, as it were, is framed um, between these two buildings, albeit buildings of rather different scale. There's a block of probably early tenements um, opposite here. And to the east of the um, facade, there is a, a lane or route, still a footpath running through here. And this seems to be where the little gatehouse here and stables flanking that lane or approach um, uh, were located. There are some clues in the geophys um, results and the description in one of the surveys um, suggest very much um, this layout. And the outer court at Oxford is in one sense conventional. Um, entered through a magnificent gatehouse and expansive in scale. But here largely defined not by lodging ranges, um, but by structures on the scale of corridors, which elsewhere serve such lodgings as they did in the southeast corner of the lodging block, as I mentioned. So the genesis of these structures at Oxford, almost certainly garden galleries, um, like these at Richmond Palace, built for Henry VII, so around the end of the 15th century, 1497-1501, and rebuilt in 1506. Here they look outwards over the Cook Garden and partly over the Privy Garden. But on that side, the view was largely blocked by interpolation of those narrow buildings which were called lodgings in 1537, but whose plan does not fit the norm. Whatever their intended primary role, their effect um, was that the Privy Gallery, here, there over here, their effect was that the Privy Gallery essentially faced the courtyard, which in turn raises the question of how this vast space was treated. It was graded to gentle slopes, as it still is, but there is no sign of features or even the route to the main entrance. So was it, I wonder, essentially dressed as a garden, rather like this? Um, and the east and west ranges conceived um, uh, of, of the outer court as double-sided garden galleries. A few years after Warham's death, his successor, uh, Archbishop Cranmer in 1537, was forced under duress to transfer both Otford and Knoll to Henry VIII. So as an aside, back to um, Croydon again, Cranmer perhaps so missed his galleries at Otford and Knoll that in the winter of 1538 to nine, i.e. the following year, he had timber felled to build this gallery at his house at Croydon. The ceiling is in its original form, resembling the Brown Gallery at Knoll. Um, I should add the panelling on the stair to the garden um, over on the left-hand side. Um, 
uh, a date from the end of the 16th century. So returning to Oxford, under Henry, extensive but unspecified work is documented in 1541 um, to 46 at a cost of more than 2,200 pounds. And much of this was probably spent on filling the moat with clay, um, requiring the construction of culverts and drains, very visible in the excavation record. Here is the, the filled moat, and here you can see against the outer wall of this lodging range, drains being constructed to pick up the rainwater pipes, which form the emptied into the moat, and those going into other drains, um, and, and this enormous culvert here is coming in from this direction. So the, the flow of water through the moat um, became a flow of water through culverts picking up, picking up drains. Um, and the present open channel on the north side here um, is in fact the base of what was a brick culvert, which presumably because it became blocked, um, was reopened um, as, an, uh, as an open stream. Henry, of course, was famously um, concerned about damp, damp climb, damp places, the unhealthiness of them, um, as were so many of his contemporaries. So I, I think there, there is a context um, for this, this major work. Um, we don't know to what extent the plan of the um, palace, of course, the main part of the palace was adapted rather than room uses changed. But from surveys, we know that separate state apartments for king and queen uh, were contrived if they did not previously exist. They may have, may have already existed for the um, reception of the, the monarch on, on, on uh, progress, but uh, um, if not, they were certainly formed in some way here. Um, Henry's successor, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, made very little use of Oxford. Um, damp remained a constant issue. That's clear from the documents. By 1548, many rooms were greatly in decay, according to the surveyors, but she did stay at Oxford on her summer progress in 1559, um, during July and August. Um, that's really the last royal um, stay at um, what then was another of the palaces acquired um, under Henry and eventually to be disposed of. So, um, under Elizabeth, the Sydney family became hereditary keepers of the palace. They held a lease on the little park and had long hoped to acquire the estate. The Queen, as usual, prevaricated in the face of several offers and increasing decay. Robert Sydney's offer in 1596 stated, that if I may have a good estate in the park, I will build a pretty house at my own charge and keep it in repair so that she may dine there as she passes by. Which indeed she had already done um, uh, with Sir Henry Sidney um, back in um, July 1573. There was still no response, but eventually in November 1601, um, the Queen, needing funds to uh, feed her troops in Ireland, agreed to the sale. And there is evidence, as I'll now explain, that the northwest tower and gallery, and the centre and western parts of the gatehouse, were adapted um, as the Sydney's hereditary lodgings, just as the Earls of Suffolk, as keepers of Ward the End after 1660, had the northwest three-story pavilion of the outer court um, as, as, as their keeper's lodgings and um, maintained within it a, um, a house of some um, modest pretension compared to the, the palace, but uh, 
um, still um, of, of, of um, a standard that uh, would fit their rank. Now, the early, early interventions in this range um, are identified viable by their function and their materials. They include this guardrobe block here in the angle, visibly added to the gatehouse prior to thought making his plan of it, a large fireplace on the south side of the cloister, and probably another answering it in the upper gallery over it. The formation of a door next to the fireplace here and a, uh, a, a window above it, implying that the cloister was by then no longer open, but enclosed by windows within each bay. An external door in the north wall associated with a lost porch, um, which was probably um, the Sydney's front door. Looking at those on the ground, um, here is the front door um, on this side. Here is the, fire, the base of the fireplace, a, a very large one. Here's the um, bay with a door here cut through the plinth and where a window has been up above, later filled in very roughly. Um, but that is the, the brickwork of this um, phase of change, as is this. Um, and here, because um, of the, the addition, um, we've got um, the, sorry, here we have got the addition of the guard robe. You can see early brickwork in English bond um, uh, abutting the brickwork of the main wall. Now there's a second phase of these interventions visible. Um, and that is, that is the context of um, the Thorpe Gatehouse plan, I said, after 1606-7. It shows an internal alternative stair up to the first floor with mostly straight flights. You can see winders at the corner and straight up onto a landing um, to give access to the principal first floor chamber um, via an internal porch here. And we know this was undertaken because um, the south window here, um, now, in, the, now on, in these alterations in the stairwell, was moved upwards across the floor line, which is about here. Um, and the small window inserted to light the space under the stair below. Consequential changes included a doorway from the by now enclosed um, lower gallery here. And you can see it cut through the original masonry. It's not built in the, the brickwork um, from the beginning. Um, and because the stairwell has now been formed here, lit from here, the other half of the chamber has to be lit and there is a little window inserted, visibly inserted, um, to um, light that. It's probably a recycled window. So there is more of this tinkering. Um, ad hoc alterations. Um, there's a timber framed extension on the south side of the tower. Um, there's a visible rebate in the wall for its lead flashing. And that new roof was carried here, sorry. And the new roof was carried over the original um, roof of the um, uh, West um, Upper Gallery, um, which suggests that the, the roof was giving trouble by this time. Um, there's a door cut into it at first floor level here. 
Um, and on the plan, um, one can see the, the doorway cut in through the old guardroom chamber to connect this um, chamber to this new build. Um, there's a single story extension on the west side of the guardroom tower at ground floor level. There are the um, joists of its roof, um, still retaining the, the, the plaster inside. Um, that is here. And there are some um, deliberately blocked lights um, in the tower windows. But Robert Sidney, now Viscount Lyle, sold the property soon after he bought it. He sold it in 1618 to 19 after this parking the Great Park. Now his improvised keeper's house survived the decay and abandonment of the rest of the house, explaining why this corner of the outer court alone um, was not demolished for its materials but at that, that time. Um, but finally, um, it was abandoned probably around the middle of the 18th century. Um, Hasted recalls um, 1778, a rather confused version of what happened, um, which suggests it happened quite early in the 18th century. So to conclude, Oxford was a spectacular but short-lived extravagance. From a period of experiment, which established the transition from medieval to early modern architecture. While at the micro scale, as we've seen, close examination of the surviving fragment illustrates how the Sydney family adapted the hereditary keeper's lodgings um, to a, a rather ad hoc house but nonetheless, a house um, fit for the Queen to come to dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for such a detailed fascinating and authoritative overview of such a major, major and important site. Um, we're waiting, waiting for questions to come in. Can I just ask a, a, an, an obvious one? Could you, has, has there been any archaeological excavation on the site other than the work by, by Brian Philp? Um, there have been a number of um, small excavations in advance of domestic extensions down near the south side, um, which have produced a number of short lengths of wall, which simply add to the confusion. Um, and so, no, there's been, apart from Brian Phillips, there's been nothing extensive at all. Are there any, any plans at all for any future? Field work? Um, not that I know, um, but uh, we may get some comments because the the site has now been, or much of it has been taken over by um, a trust following the uh, uh, consideration by the uh, Seven Oaks Council that um, initiated this study. So um, they may well have um, plans for further investigation and. Um, uh, presentation. Yeah, you've got Colin starting to come in. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you, very informative. Um, one question, practical one. Um, can you visit the site? Um, yes. It, the the um, the north the north range is of the, the outer court is within what is now a public open space in the village, and there are explanatory signboards. Um, giving information about the place. That, that's good. Um, Nick Rushby from the Archbishop's the Bishop's Palace Conservation Trust um, just informs us that uh, there was recent excavation in the rear garden of 5 Bubbleston Road. Oh, um, and there are plans for more limited excavations um, near to the Northwest Tower. 
um, in the future. Um, John Cooper would like to ask, um, why did Henry VIII spend so much money on the site in the 1540s? Um, did he go there to hunt? Or was it a stopping off point for him to review fortifications in Kent? Um, probably to hunt. There were two enormous hunting parks attached to the place. Um, but uh, I, without going back to my, my sources and notes, I don't know how much use Henry made of it. Um, he spent money there, um, but he also had Noel just up the road. So I, I would have to do some um, checking back to, to answer the question fully. And on that thing, we have two, two more questions. Um, Julian Draper asks whether you can tell us more about the two parks. And Rowena, Rowena Willard says she knows Rotham and Noel both had or have deer parks. And can you comment more on Rotham? Um, I can't comment more on Rotham other than I think it was abandoned in the 14th century, if my memory serves me well. Um, but uh, um, Tim Tatton Brown's book on Lambeth Palace a few years ago has quite a lot on the other palaces uh, that was known at the time. So I th think that's probably a good starting point to find out more about Rotham. Um, hunting parks, there was a large one to the south that came right up to the house um, and extended west over to the, um, the River Darrant. Um, there was another, if I remember correctly, further away to the southeast, um, the Great Park and the Little Park. Again, I, I, with notice, I, I could I could find more, what is known about um, their extent um, away from the house. Sandra Robinson has just uh, just just chatted, put a thing on the chat to correct my pronunciation. It's Rutan, apparently not Rutan. Oh right, Rutan, Rutan. A um, couple more then. Is there evidence that damp was an increasing problem over the centuries? Um, no, people were just more aware of it. Um, and things were not helped, I suppose, by, by um, periods of neglect. Um, the, the water courses still run um, from two sources, one to the northeast of the house and one to the east, two natural springs, because um, Otford is sitting at the point where the underlying clays emerge below below the chalk. So it, it's a spring line. There are lots of springs. Um, if the water courses aren't maintained, then things become very soggy indeed. And was this the primary reason for abandoning the building or were there other reasons? Ah, why, why was it abandoned? Because it was an enormous folly. Um, and it was probably not terribly well built. It was very damp and um, it went the way of, of other follies um, like non such. Um, so uh, the royal work stopped spending money on it basically and um, Elizabeth had no love of it. She had far too many palaces inherited um, from Henry. Um, and Sydney wanted, I think, well, the Sydneys, they're all sequence of them, um, wanted to build a small house there, a sort of hunting lodge. Um, but then the, the Sydney, who finally acquired it, um, basically um, did an asset stripping job, broke up the estate, disembarked, and sold the, um, the, the, the house for the value of its materials. Um, what year, when, what was the date of the original manor house um, before it was extended by Warren? Oh, um, like most of them, it, 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 its first masonry buildings are around the 12th century um, and various and Romanesque um, architectural fragments and engaged shaft and capital um, found by indeed, um, by, by, uh, um, Philp's excavation um, built into later structure. And the same is true indeed of, um, of Charing and, um, and Croydon. They both have 
recycled Romanesque material in them. Um, as to the real origin beyond that, who knows, there hasn't been enough excavation. Um, but certainly Croydon is um, Middle Saxon in origin as a site, um, and indeed as a, as a monastery nearby. Uh, I've got a question from, from John Hines. Are there any aspects of the building which could be considered specific to the Prince of the Church? Or is this sort of palatial structure at this time to be expected um, to be exactly the same, whether the patron is secular or ecclesiastical? I think it's the same in both Wolsey and, and Warham, um, a busy building at an almost super um, royal scale. Um, and no, it, 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 I, I don't think there's a, there's a great difference. Other than, you know, the, all of these houses, of course, were intended to accommodate the monarch and, 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 and indeed visiting monarchs. Um, so they're, they're, the competition is how big, how innovative um, one can be. Okay. Um, Megan Aldrich is struck by the similarity and dimensions of the galleries at Oxford to those recreated at Pont Hill in the early 19th century by James Wyatt for William Beckford. Um, could Wyatt have seen enough at Oxford around 1800 to have inspired him at Pont Hill? Um, if he was a good enough archaeologist, um, he could have um, worked out that the uh, galleries, as, 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 as I did, um, the, the height and scale of the galleries. But no, I, he's far more likely to be inspired by the Wingard um, illustration um, of the Richmond galleries. I think that was, that was quite well known among antiquarians by... Uh, by 1800. Okay. Uh, and finally, we just had two observations. And one from Den Richardson to say that Henry VIII may have stayed at Oxford en route to the fields of the cloth of gold. Um, and Nick Rushby says that there are, uh, there are in fact, Little Saxon documentary references to, to the states or, um, or, or establishments um, of the, at Oxford in the, in the ninth century. Although whether that indicates that, that so there's something on the site of the, of the manor house is of course a, yeah, well, there's middle oh. tank, certainly there's middle Saxon material from three or four hundred meters east um, of of the present site, um, but you know, there, there's certainly going to be a settlement there, um, but uh, whether it's under the palace or not is another matter.